Warning, the following material is extremely disturbing. On Grave Matter, we try to be as accurate as possible and we collect information from many different sources. We don't condone or glorify murder and we try to be as sensitive as possible to victims and their families while approaching a serious subject matter with a sense of humor. Listener discretion is advised. Alright, welcome everybody to episode 8 of The Grave Matter. This is Chris Lang along with Jill Gentry. Hey y'all. And we have a wonderful episode in store for you this evening. We are going to be discussing Sean Vincent Gillis. Did I say that right? Yes, you did. Alright, as well as a dude named Elmo. So we're going to get into that a little bit later. Uh, <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's been such a, such a great adventure so far. It's been a wonderful ride. Just communicating with everybody online and uh, seeing the interest grow in this, it's, it's been amazingly rewarding. So we appreciate you guys very much. We appreciate you guys subscribing, especially. That's, that's, the, that's the big ticket. Yeah, yeah, for real. Spread the word. Um, I've been talking to Jimmy Woo, and we have decided Woo. to go to the San Marcos Body Farm. Um, if they let us. So that is definitely something that uh, should be coming up eventually, as well as our premium content. We're going to start recording these little mini episodes about different adventures that we've had. Um, Jill, as a as a uh, paranormal investigator, has some really, really cool stories. I have some stories from back in the Marines. Well, one story, but it's pretty crazy um, about a haunted hangar. So if anybody... Um, if any of my Marines are listening, you guys know exactly what I'm talking about. So uh, that should be really cool. So we'll figure out a way to uh, get that out and, and um, deliver it. Yeah, it's pretty much uh, whatever the hell we feel like talking about, I guess. Whatever yeah, sounds good, whatever anybody expresses interest in. Yep. And we have, we definitely, you definitely have some cool stories. So I've got a lot. I should probably write down at least, you know, something that'll remind me what they are. Cause, Bullet points. Yeah. We've also, in our studio, we've added a few cool things. We now have pictures of the killers that we've discussed. So directly in front of me, behind Jill, is uh, these these creepy guys staring at me. But it's really cool. I see Popeye's grandpa up there. Um, <laughs> cool. I even him. got uh, Sean up there. We haven't talked about him yet, and he's already up there. Yeah, he's looking at you kind of weird. Yeah, well, you know. He's kind of a he's Yeah, he seems like dick, a... So goofy disturbed kind of individual you, know? you don't even have a clue he is probably one of the worst um as far as that ominous breeze what was that i don't know that was kind of creepy i don't know we'll see if the microphone picked it up but that was pretty weird yeah that was odd um yeah he's a he's a little bit of a freak um i haven't heard of this guy at all i was so, hoping i was hoping that and you know I, went, I don't really do like you'll be like oh i'm gonna do this person and so I intentionally don't do research on it because I like to be surprised and have that natural conversation flow. So I'm really excited to learn about this guy. Um, is he from Texas, too? Um, no, he's from Louisiana. Louisiana. We've had a couple of those lately, huh? Yeah. yeah we're yeah. kind of just uh, surfing around the, the bottom 50, you know. Or the <laughs> yeah, I know. Checking sure. out the southern states first and yeah. we'll meander around here and there. And and Bayou Killer was from there as well, and so is Elmo. I, I got so. kind of sick of Texas for a little while, so I figured we'd go over to... Louisiana, maybe we'll wander back to Texas and well, we'll hello. see. <laughs> hello, neighbor. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's so weird. Yeah, it's uh not too far away. So yeah, no, for sure. Louisiana had some pretty sick tickets too, compared. You know. Oh man, yeah. As far as crime goes, I mean, we are in the right place. You We're know? right on up there with El Paso or whatever. El what? Paso and Houston. Yeah, and man, El Paso and Houston. A lot of stuff going, on. and even uh, even Angel Resendez, who was not from El Paso, pretty much surrendered there. So, I mean. Calling him home, you know? So, so shall we uh, just start talking about him? Then? Yeah, let's get into it. All right. So, I did a lot of research on this guy. Um, he is, uh, he's pretty messed up, to say the least. Um, and it, he, of course, like, like they normally do, he had a bad childhood, or like you usually hear, or sometimes hear anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, his father had like mental illness, hmm. and he was an alcoholic, and right after... Gillis was born, he abandoned their family. He just disappeared. Seems to be a trend. Yeah. But growing up, um, he was reported to have decent grades. He was 
considered an average good kid for a Baton Rouge area. Is that where he was from, born in Baton Rouge? Yes, that's where he was from, was Baton Rouge. He did have anger issues and kind of a short temper. He would, you know, bust into fits of rage or whatever. Mm. And his uh, his neighbor actually recalled a time when he was a child hearing something in the middle of the night, getting up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and he was outside kicking all the trash cans and screaming and stomping the trash and wow. losing his mind. Um, well, that's alarming. <laughs> yeah, for, for a kid. <laughs> yeah, how um, old was he when that happened? I didn't really, it didn't really say. It just said huh. that he was a child or whatever. Troubled youth. Troubled youth. Kicking over garbage receptacles. Yeah, it's a bad start. Yeah, no kidding. We've seen that so much, you know, with um, some of our other killers here, you know. It just seems like, it seems like there's a correlation. And and, <laughs> and also, um, bacterial meningitis, right? And did he have bacterial meningitis as well? No. Not well, that I've fuck. seen. There goes my theory. Yep, not this time. Sorry about that. Shit. You lose one every once in a while, I guess. So um, troubled childhood. He's born in Baton Rouge. Yes, which I think means red stick. I think translated. I'm not sure. Maybe that sounds like what it means. Rouge is red. Baton is stick. Red I think stick. That's, yeah, I think that's what it means. Hey, from red stick, Louisiana. Hannah. <laughs> I don't know where that just little font of weird ass knowledge just came from, but I heard it at some point. I guess <laughs> that's a nice way to put it. Yeah. So he went to community college for a little while. Um, and after that, he bounced between a few low paying jobs. Um, he lived with his mother until he was 30 years old. At that point, she actually accepted a job in Atlanta and left. And he was left to his own devices for the first time. Pretty much. How old was he? 30. Oh, OK. OK. Yeah. So she went to Atlanta and left him behind in their home. And he stayed there. Interesting. Um, after a while, he, he became lonely. He was always living with somebody until that point. So he became obsessed with and addicted to pornography to the point where he was neglecting his work. So wow. he that, that's where the bouncing around between low paying jobs came in. Yeah. But his mother always sent him money. So he Just was never out or whatever. Yeah. He was never uh, really in too bad of trouble, I guess. Yeah. But he was very angry that she left. Hmm. He would actually go into rages in his own home regularly by himself to the point where his neighbors could actually hear them hear him screaming and raging through his house breaking things so he's done this his whole life yeah he had he's had a temper issue since the very beginning Jeez. yeah i wonder if he ever like went to counseling or anything or tried to work on it you know doesn't sound like it no i don't think so i never came across anything like that but yeah that's how pissed off he was that she abandoned him as a 30 year old man while still paying his bills like yeah yeah it's a real while still paying his bills for real um so, over time, his um, obsession with porn grew, um, and then around 1992, he started peeping in windows. Um, he was caught. Wow. Yeah, and despite all of this, his lack of responsibility, his rages, all this, um, he actually started a relationship with a woman named Terry Lemoyne. All right, for a second, hold on. I'm, I've been sick for a few days, so I'm all, like, congested sounding, and I keep coughing, and... It's going to be some weird editing going on. (laughs) Just work Um, with us, damn it. I'm sweating like I'm on trial, like no shit. Um, (laughs) Pun intended. It's it's rough. I feel like I have a campfire built in my sinus cavity. Jesus Christ. It sucks pretty hard. So cut me some slack if you hear some weirdness and (laughs) some... uh, If it sounds like she's trying to avoid coughing, it's because she is. Yeah. And if it sounds like I'm talking underwater, it's because I am. So (laughs) anyway, back to the pervert. Um, He had a girlfriend. Yeah, yeah, he got he a, had girlfriend. a girlfriend. Yeah, yeah. So, despite all of his weirdness and his anger and his lack of responsibility and all of this, he started dating a woman named Terry Lemoyne hmm. uh, in 1994. Ironically enough, that's the same year he killed his first victim. Huh. His first victim was Anne Bryan. She was 81 years old. Oh, jeez. He claimed he only wanted to rape her. What oh nice, well, that's what a nice yeah, guy. That's, that's, yeah, okay. Um, but she wouldn't stop screaming, so he stabbed her fifty times in the head, the chest, and the genitals, and he almost decapitated her. Yeah, fifty is a lot. That's a that's a big round number. I you think know? she probably would have stopped screaming after maybe like I don't know a third of that. <laughs> God, that's um, tough to think about. You know what I mean? It's pretty rough. Yeah, yeah. Uh, eighty-one years old. Jesus Christ. So he continues on with his uh, porn addiction. Um, he's starting to watch more and more violent types of porn that that are, you know, rape, death, dismemberment. Um, and at one point, he even showed Terry a photo of a dead woman. Um, I didn't even know they had porn like that. That's crazy. 
They got all the things. My porn is much more regular. <laughs> hamsters and stuff. Oh man. Yeah, my dad would talk about patients that, that that literally happen. Hamsters, you know, in strange places. That's gross. It's a real thing. Yeah. People are fucking weird, man. We wouldn't have a job doing this if people weren't fucking weird. That's true. Um. So he showed Terry a picture of a dead woman, and she just kind of brushed it off like, "We're being weird," you yeah, know. What yeah. I mean, like. Was it a woman he killed? No, it was. Uh, it was just something, like something off the internet. Yeah, or something off the internet. Which probably took 13 minutes to download. And 40 minutes for him to whack off to. <laughs> Back in 1995. Yeah, no shit. Or four or whatever. <laughs> dial up. That's that dial up porn. He must have been pretty fucking committed. Pixelated ass shit. Yeah. So he killed that woman, the 81 year old woman, and he didn't kill again for another five years. Really? Yeah. He just played house with Terry, I guess. Yeah, I'm not yeah. sure. He was with her the whole time. Uh huh. Um, Weird. They were in a 10 year relationship. Hmm. She was with him through all the murders because he killed her. Or he killed the first woman right after they got together. Yeah. I wonder if she was like a temptation that he had to fulfill in a different way. Nah. I'll get to that. <laughs> so in January of 99 to January of 2000, he murdered four more women. After taking a five year break, he mur- murdered four in a year. What? Yeah. This is kind of consistent with his like rage. You know what I mean? I feel like if he's going into these fits of rage, it's more like abstract kind of abstract's not the right word, but maybe it is. I don't know where it's just sort of it's not as premeditated. It's just pure emotion. I feel like that's kind of this dude's M.O. You know what I mean? That's what it seems like. Yeah, I'm not I'm not sure. He he just did little uh, like little spurts here and there with long, you know, a long break between that first the first two. But after that, they were pretty consistent after that. Huh. So I don't know if he. Did the first one and then had to work his way up to do it again, or just didn't have opportunity to do it again, or yeah. was thinking out how he's going to carry it, carry it out, or learn from his mistakes, or whatever. So hmm. he killed his sixth vi- victim in October of two thousand. He killed his seventh victim in October of two thousand three. So that was a pretty decent. That's break. fucking weird. Yeah, and then and this is all in Texas. I mean, all, I'm sorry, all in Louisiana. Mm-hmm. In the Baton Rouge area? Mm-hmm. Wow. Um, and then he killed his, fi- his final victim in uh, February of 2004. Lucky number seven. Yeah. So out of the last seven victims, because he had eight total, including the 81-year-old. Okay. So the last seven victims, um, all of them were prostitutes except for one. Um, they were all in their mid-30s to early 50s. They were all strangled, raped, stabbed to death, and mutilated. I'm going to go out on a limb here and assume the 81-year-old was not a prostitute. No, I don't believe so. <laughs> not at the time, anyways. She was probably just a crime of opportunity or a neighbor or somebody broke into their house like he didn't plan it, you know what I mean? Yeah. Didn't seek her out. He just decided to do it. And he raped her? Uh-huh. Man, that's something... Weird. That's it's a crazy. new kind of evil. That's yeah. an old kind of evil, actually, but it's a shitty kind of evil. Yeah, for sure. So um, they were all left in remote areas far, farther away from Baton Rouge. So he like drove them out to like a field or whatever. Exactly. Um, Makes sense. Yeah. So he didn't take them very far to kill them, I think. But then after he did, he disposed of them in further away places. Trying to be smart about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's like the Bayou Killer. Yeah. You know what I mean? Dominique. Yeah, kind of had the same same mo. But it was like a familiar route that he traveled, you know? Right. It was always like off this one freeway. He would find people and kind of go into a neighboring parish on purpose because he knew the law enforcement didn't really communicate. Right. Yeah. I wonder if this dude was doing the same thing. I think he just didn't want to shit close to home, you know what I mean? Like, well, yeah. Mm-hmm. So he had this guy had like a stupid, tw- twisted sense of humor. One Not of his, surprising. <laughs> one of his victims was found posed next to a street sign. Um, she was posed on like a, like a ballet dancer type of... Oh, wow. Stance. That's creepy. Um, And the sign laying next to her was a dead end sign. Oh, man, that's fucked up. Yeah. Another victim he had, she was reportedly hacked up so bad that they couldn't even tell she was human for a minute. Like, oh, shit. Yeah, he really, like, destroyed her. Like, it's like Dahmer's fridge. Ripped her up. God, that's bad. Because we watch Dexter, you know what I mean? And, like, you see some shit, but you know they're humans. <laughs> I mean, you'd have to be pretty bad off. Right. Yeah. I think it's a little different knowing that, you know, I think about it. We read so much stuff about this kind of thing. You know what I mean? And and stuff like Dahmer, like necrophilia and things like that. 
and I always think of the same thing. Like it's getting to like a comfortable, you know, like we're comfortable around that type of thing, thinking about it, talking about it. Desensitize a little bit. Yeah. Until you think about like crime scene photos, like Jody Arias, you know, dude, that was bad. And you think about how he looked after a post-mortem and you're like, I saw so many pictures of the dude when he was alive, you know, via the trial and whatever was on the news. And then I saw, if you haven't seen this shit, man, where did you post it? Someone posted it. It might've been creepy serial killers. Uh, one of the Facebook groups that we're a huge fan of and, and um, communicate with often. But I don't know. I saw this. I, yeah, I, it was it was the postmortem pictures of him. What was his name? Uh, Travis Marshall, I believe. Okay. So of Travis. Yeah. And whew, he did not look the same at all. Right. And that's what happens. It was like purple and bloated and full of holes. But when you think about these people like Ted Bundy and Dahmer committing these acts postmortem, you just think of it as a the person but not breathing. And that's not what it's like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at Travis, you know, his, yeah. it's not, it's it completely look, different. It doesn't look like the same person or even a human for the most part. Yeah. Especially in this case, you know what I mean? Right. Mm-hmm. And this guy did perform necrophilia. So. And how do you get comfortable with that? I mean, it's gotta be, that's, something's twisted. This guy's messed up. Some of the things you're going to find out about him, you're going to be like, okay. Well. That bacterial meningitis, I swear. You know, <laughs> yeah. Right here in our own backyard in Texas. Man. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about that in a little while. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so all of the bodies, that all the people he killed, they found the bodies, but they never found a murder weapon, no witnesses, and no fingerprints. Um, but he wasn't particularly careful. He didn't use, you know, condoms. He, you know what I mean? Stuff like that. Um yeah, it sounds like he's one of those crimes of passion type rage it out. Well, get this. He he would cut off hands and feet, stuff like that. But at one point, they found one of his victims, and his DNA was all in her fingernails. He cut off her left hand, left her right hand, which is the one she was clawing at him with. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, that's not careful. So, right. um, so his DNA was everywhere. Yeah. But it wasn't in the system, so they didn't know who the hell it was. They could just link the crimes to each other. They couldn't link it to anybody specific. Oh, they were like, this DNA matches that, but they have no idea. Okay, Right, and actually, one of the... A victim had, like, a a run-in with him. What do you mean? Somebody... Okay, so when these crimes started happening, um, somebody reported that Derek Todd Lee was actually the culprit. Hmm. Because it kind of fit his crimes, too. He's another serial killer in the area. Right. And... He was already on the hook for like seven murders and rapes, and so they were like, "That makes sense." But then they ran his DNA against those, and they were they didn't match. So he didn't wind up uh, taking the fall for those. But the way uh, Gillis started murdering is, he basically started out he would strangle his victims with zip ties, which that's, seems like um seems difficult. Yeah, they're not that big and not pleasant, but still yeah. like I guess because they don't release like you know. You pull them tight. And well, then, did he put? Did he finish it, or did he just grab one and kind of? Did I, he close it? You know. What yeah, I, mean? I think he cinched it around their neck and pulled it tight, and then did what he wanted to do, and then finished them off. Wow. So he would he would strangle them with zip ties. He cut off their hands and feet. He was known to carve off nipples and tattoos. Jesus. Yeah, he saved body parts as trophies. Um, he cannibalized their corpses. Um, wow. Yeah. So he, he ate them. He had sex with them. Mm-hmm. He performed sex acts on them. Obviously killed bodies. them. Yeah. Um, he had one victim in his shower that he took a shower with. He would stand there holding her up and he would wash her hair and bathe her. And then he would sit her down and do his self. Uh, so yeah, that's the kind of guy we're looking at. He actually cut off the hands of uh, one of his victims and he took them home and he did manicures on them. Like he painted her nails and stuff. Jesus Christ, this guy's out of fucking control, man. Um, yeah, he was... He was out of pocket. Like, he needed to fucking slow down. Um, <laughs> he needed to slow down. Yeah. He should take several seats. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Um, so, he actually... Jo- Johnny May Williams was one of his victims, and that's the one he uh, took her hands, and he he did, painted her nails and all that. Now, his final victim in 2004, he actually took pictures of himself posing with her hacked-up body. He set up, like, his own little mock crime scene... Like, out where he killed her, like, this field. He took pictures of her body in the trunk of his car with his license plate visible. Um, what? Yeah, a lot of stupid shit. Like, he didn't like give it, a fuck. Yeah, and then he saved them all to his computer just so he could go back and visit them later, I guess. Wow. Um. So the cops found them on his computer, obviously. Yeah. Which was not super good for him, as far as the defense <laughs> goes. Right. Russian hackers. 
right yeah it's kind of hard to blame that like you stand there with a big smile on your face next to your victim and your car <laughs> license plate showing it's like jesus did, did you make sure to put your fingerprints in the photo or you know <laughs> right photoshop's not that good back then so uh social security number on the bottom corner <laughs> so yeah like i said he um he didn't worry about hiding hiding his dna or his evidence you know whatever yeah now his undoing during his final murder he left a tire track in the field where the body was found which you would think like like that's what did it yeah okay well it was a super rare set of goodyear tires um and so the police contacted the Goodyear Tire Company, and they, they asked for, like... Where did these go in the area? Yeah. There was only 200 people that had purchased those tires. Hmm. Um, so they narrowed it down by area, and then they subpoenaed the people who bought the tires um, for their DNA. Um, oh, shit. Yeah. And his match, obviously. So police brought him in. They questioned him. They actually kicked his freaking door down and, like, raided his house. And his wow. girlfriend was sleeping in there and with she him. she had no idea. She had no idea. And so um, she's like screaming, what's going on? What's going on? And this all creeps me out. And uh, I don't know why, but he was like, I don't know, honey bunny. Like that was his nickname for her, which grosses me out because it reminds me of um, Pulp Fiction. Like, <laughs> you know, talking about the diner, the yes. diner scene at the end. Fucking love I'm that I'm proud movie. of you, honey bunny. Yeah. It's okay, honey bunny. Like that always like makes my skin crawl so when i read that i was like ew that's gross <laughs> like that's just weird me out. yeah so they drug him to the police station and they questioned um, him about if they would find evidence in his car they just straight up asked him like we're gonna find evidence in this car uh that belongs to you and um he started out by trying to uh, to explain why there would be evidence in his car instead of saying like denying it and he's like oh uh johnny may williams which is one of his victims he's yeah, like, yeah. she was a friend of mine um and I paid her to clean my house, but I would give her rides to and from my house. And uh, he was like, that could be, you know, if you find her DNA in my car, that would be wise because I gave her rides all the time. And or if you find it in my house. And so they asked about blood evidence. They were like, well, is there any reason there'd be blood in there in your car? And he's like, oh, yeah. Uh, see, I went and got Johnny one day and she started her period. <laughs> oh, my God. This is the stupidest fucking thing I've Seriously. ever read in my life. No, it gets worse than that. Okay. So I feel like I'm getting dumber by the second reading this shit, but hear yeah. me out. This is what he said. Okay. This genius. <laughs> he says, she started her period while riding in my car. It was a bloodbath. There was blood everywhere, soaked into the seat. And they said, okay, well, what about blood in the back seat? Will we find any of her blood in the back seat? And he said, oh, yeah, there was probably, there'd probably be blood in the back seat because like her, she was bleeding so much that, that blood was like flying out the window of the of the front of the front of the car and in through the back windows back into the back seat <laughs> this fucking guy wow this dude has no idea how the medical field works it was i actually wrote in my notes i feel dumber discussing this dumb shit what the fuck <laughs> <laughs> because i was sitting there reading it home alone you're like this is not fucking i'm possible. like typing my notes and i'm like what <laughs> what a waterhead like <laughs> A waterhead. There's a lawyer out there somewhere that could probably make it work, but that's just yeah. the fucking stupidest thing. That's crazy. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if he knows how this works, but Obviously it's not, not like a sprinkler system, you guys. Like All of his previous... <laughs> All of his previous um, companions were dead already, so I mean, oh, I yeah, know. a living girlfriend for ten years, so yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, I don't know. I can't believe he thought that was gonna work. Why didn't? Wow. Okay. I, I don't know, but what I the was, cops do? Probably they're, laughed. <laughs> they're like, got it. They're like, okay, man, that's <laughs> you're definitely guilty now. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, and then he was like, hey, by the way, you know, you guys found my tire tracks, right? Well, um, see, like. A week or so ago, I had to piss really bad. I was drinking, and I was driving home, and I had to pee. So I pulled off into this field, and I and I pissed. And they were like, "Oh, is that why your tire tracks were next to that dead body?" And he's like, "Yeah, like I had to, I had to go pee pee." <laughs> like, yeah, it was just weird. <laughs> yeah, and so he's like, "Yeah, so I was drinking and driving, and I had to take a leak. So I pulled on some private property and took a piss right next to a corpse. Um, can I go home now?" <laughs> So the police searched the home that he shared with his girlfriend and uh, found dozens of pictures of him with his victims. Oh, yeah. He has the fucking pictures. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I wrote to his girlfriend. I found her super easy. You did? Uh, yeah. What? 
I wrote to her because I wanted to interview her. I haven't gotten a response yet. Like, how the fuck did that go? <laughs> she hasn't written back yet, but if she does, maybe we can do like a side episode about it. Yeah, I know, absolutely. Um, because I want to know what the fuck. You know what I mean? You like, want to know the inside scoop. Yeah, and she's done plenty of interviews, but okay. but um, she's, we'd love to. What's her name? Uh, Terry Le- Lemoyne. Terry Lemoyne. We would love to hear from her. Yeah, um, I found her in less than five seconds. It was super easy, um, and I. F- Found a picture of the two of them together, and then a picture of her Nick currently, and she looks exactly the same as she did. Okay. And she still lives in the same fucking house. That house? She lives in that house. Wow. Yeah. So, um, they searched the home, and uh, she didn't believe that he was guilty. So, she, she just went into the police station, and they let her talk to him, and she walked up, and she picked up a little phone receiver, and she was like, are what, they say, are what they're saying true? Like, yeah. did you commit these crimes? And he goes, yeah, I'm sorry, honey bunny. <laughs> And then she just got up and walked out of the room. Hasn't Never seen talked since. to him again. Yeah. He told the police, he's like, I'm sorry I hurt people, but I would do it again. If you let me out on the street today, I'll find somebody before sundown. Yeah. Weird. Yeah. So. What a weird MO. You know what I mean? Like everything he does is just so off. That's what's up. Like I didn't kill anybody. She was on her period. Oh um, man. Her period blows just flying out of the car. I have no idea. She man. got a bloody nose and that's how she died. That's a bloody nose would have been a better fucking story than my periods flying out of the window <laughs> and like, back into the, the back fuck? seat. Like, yeah, man. like it's a cigarette butt. <laughs> <laughs> man, so you're not stupid. kidding that. And between that and the fucking pictures on his computer and I have to go pee and there was just this field and I was drunk and I happened to pull up next to a corpse. Can I go home now? Yeah, that's weird as fuck. <laughs> yeah, he was um, he was an interesting one to, you know, <laughs> look into. What I don't know. Um, so eventually he admitted to dismembering at least one of his victims, Joyce, uh, in the kitchen of their home while Terry was at work. Um, he did some kind oh, of oh shit, the same house, the same house. He did like this half-assed autopsy on the, on their kitchen floor, um, and you know, detectives, you know, we were talking about luminol last night. Yeah, 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 yeah. Detectives went in there and sprayed luminol and, like, put on the black light and, like, his, like, underneath the, around the border of the kitchen, like the, what you call, under the sink and shit. Floorboard kind of. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. It lit up like a fucking Christmas tree. Like. Oh, shit. There's blood everywhere. So, apparently, he wasn't half a shit worth fucking housekeeping either. Yeah. And, I mean, he said Johnny was his housekeeper, that, that one. Uh, That's true. Period lady. So, um, it's just. <laughs> Yeah, he didn't hide his tracks at all. I mean, it I, seems I can just like he am- didn't even try to lie correctly. Like it's weird. Well, he like hacked up a body in his kitchen floor, and I can just picture him like throwing a freaking like like a hand towel on the floor, like with his foot wiping, you know, and then being like, "That's good enough," you know. Yeah, fuck it. Yeah. But that'd be, I man, I just what I what I immediately thought was like, dude, wouldn't he be concerned that like his girlfriend could come home early or? Well, I believe she worked night shift. Um, and he drove her to and from work, Okay. which, um, he later admitted and she later confirmed that she had been riding in that car a few times with a corpse in the trunk of the car. Um, and she knew she only knew because, um, she, on one night he picked her up one morning, he picked her up from work to take her home. And she's like, what the hell is that stink? Like it stinks in here. And he was like, Oh, I hit an animal. Like a, I hit roadkill on the, on the road. And, uh, so he brought her home and they pulled in the driveway and she said that she got out and went in the house to go to bed and he immediately started washing the car and he pulled in and like opened the trunk and was fucking around in there and so she put it together later on. Yeah. Um, but he okay. said, yeah, that's my bad. She actually rode in the car with a corpse a few more than one time. Um, Fuck. Yeah. What did that, um, I wonder what that did to her mentally. I don't know, but uh, so it gets weirder though. Believe like. Really? Yeah. So okay, the girl he dismembered, Joyce. Uh, he kept talking to the police and discussing with the police like how gorgeous her legs were, hmm. and he's like, notwithstanding that they were cut off of somebody and no longer attached to a body, they were the prettiest freaking legs I'd ever seen. Like they were like perfect legs, and they were just like okay, you Got know, it. like yeah. Wow. Um, so he actually expressed remorse here and there, and he even started corresponding with um. A friend of his, one of his victims, Donna. This woman's name was Tammy Prepara. Prepara? Huh. So she wrote to Gillis and she was like, I couldn't believe you wrote back. What an idiot. Unfortunately, Tammy died of cancer before his trial. Um, but she somehow managed to, like, in a last ditch effort, she got those 
those letters where they corresponded back and forth, she got them to the police via somebody else. So they walked into his trial in court and handed him, like the lead investigator or whatever, a stack of letters to and from her and him. Wow. That was two... The letters were to and from uh, the victim's friend, right? right. Mm-hmm. Okay. So the victim's friend decided she was going to write to him to see if she'd get any information out of him. Okay, or, so that was the purpose of the letter. Right. I didn't know if it was... Okay. Yeah, and uh, he wrote back, and he was honest. And he was like, don't worry about it. Like, she was she was so drunk at the time, it only took about a minute and a half for her to suc- uh, like succumb to unconsciousness. And she was uh, she was dead a few seconds later. And he said her last words were, I can't breathe. And then he said something. He said something to her about like I still puzzle over my need for po- like post mortem dismemberment. He's like, I don't understand um, why I do it. There must be something deep in my subconscious that really needs that kind of macabre action. Huh. Like this is the stuff he's telling to his victim's best yeah, friend. Yeah, he's not. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He's not. He's not so smart to say that, but he doesn't realize he's not being smart. It seems like he's just trying to be honest in that moment. That's creepy. Yeah. So she delivered. She had those letters delivered to the, his trial, mm-hmm. and as soon as they got them in their hands, they're like, "Well, this is the final nail in his coffin." Like, I mean, not, super. Yeah, not that they needed any more, but right. So they asked him why he murdered so many innocent women, and he said, uh, "They were already dead to me, just straight up." Wow. I wonder um, what that means. Yeah, I don't know, but. It still gets weirder. How? <laughs> so he's on. When does he? When does he go to trial? When is the trial? Because that's what that's when that's what we're talking about, right? I mean, two thousand four. In two thousand four, that's when the trial was. Okay. That's when his last victim was, um, and he was found shortly after that. So it was two thousand four, two thousand five, something like that. It okay. was pretty recent, all things considered. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, for sure. Um, so how does it get weirder? So they asked, um, during his interview with the police and in court and all that, he openly admitted, um, for apparently no reason, that he had always fantasized about having sex with his mother. You know, I just can't imagine, like, he was 30 when she left, and thank God she did, because who knows what would have happened. Yeah, um, no kidding. If he openly admits to a bunch of, you know, strangers that he'd always fantasized about it. It makes me wonder why she left in the first place. I don't know, but, um... He, qu- he was quoted saying, of course I've thought about having sex with my mother. Like, it's the most natural thing in the world. <laughs> Duh. Um, she's not an unattractive person, even if you see her now. I've often thought that if she passed away, y'all would find me in bed with her. What the actual fuck? Murder and mayhem. Like, that's gross. So, um, this may affect the chances that Terry will ever contact me if she ever hears this, but it can't be... Uh, ignored okay um so terry maintained that their relationship was romantic but completely platonic um they were together for almost a decade and she told she she told people in an interview um that she asked she asked sean like so why don't we have sex like you know whatever right and he was like um, he told her that he thought sex was nasty and dirty and okay Dexter <laughs> and uh, he didn't think he should be participating in it and I'm like um, well the way you fucking do it it is dirty and nasty <laughs> I mean you're raping people you're forcing yourself on them you're watching rape and murder porn you're yeah. uh, engaging in necrophilia um, you're talking about sleeping with your mother and fantasies you've had about that so maybe in your cases but Eh, just a likely cover story, in my opinion. Yeah, uh, well, you know, she dodged a bullet, if that's true, and... Uh, yeah, no kidding. I'm Sounds sure, like it's true. I'm sure, like, she was just relieved, like, sweet, I don't have to pretend like I have a headache. <laughs> <laughs> um, she went to she went to Atlanta. She went to a whole other state. No, I'm talking about Terry, his uh, girlfriend. Oh, I was, no, yeah, I was talking about the mom, sorry. So Terry, to this day, still lives in the same house. Um, and, get this shit, you're not gonna believe this. Okay. The car with all the rape, or the all the uh, period blood in it. <laughs> yeah, that car is sitting in her backyard right now. She still has that fucking car. She kept it. What? She said she tried to give it back to the people that sold it to her, and they were like, like the company that sold it to her, and they were like, uh, it's full of 
like biohazardous material so no thanks yeah like uh okay and then she was like maybe i'll send it to like a like sell it to like Murder or donate it. yeah yeah or something yeah um but That's as a cool idea as of now she lives in the same house that her boyfriend dismembered a woman in the kitchen of like she stands in there to cook meals for her and tried know. to clean up with paper towels yeah and his car which has got to smell like god def- only knows what at yeah. this point is sitting in the backyard of her house in Louisiana, like just baking and getting good. Ugh. And that is all I have on Sean Vincent Gillis. And that is the story of good old Sean Vincent it, Gillis. I mean, it's it's kind of enough. You know what I mean? No, it's just weird. Like that's like it's not. You know, that's just a weird story. You know what I mean? That, yeah. guy's, that guy has some, and I feel like I say it every episode, that guy had some weird tendencies, you know? Yeah, I wish I felt better because I was excited about reading that one, but my timing was all off because I feel like crap and I had to keep stopping. Hey, keep we, you know choking. what? We got to keep going. We have to be consistent with it and, you know, I can I can clean it up a bit. And I'm going to lice all this. Uh, the microphone. Microphone here. Uh, you got the pop screen in front of it, so you'll be okay. I've, uh, I've been, we've been putting this off for a while because of being sick and, <clears> you know. Dexter, so <laughs> that's all good. Which I'm ready to go watch. Yeah, let's um, yeah. So what a crazy story, and um, I'm, I'm I'm excited to get into my guy, who's also from Louisiana, Elmo Patrick Sonnier. His name was Elmo, so you know it's gonna be a bad fucking situation. <laughs> you know he's pissed off. You know what I mean? But he went by Pat. <laughs> Pat, huh? Patrick, <laughs> Elmo. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Elmo and Eddie, him and his brother. No, so. now they sound Sesame Street as shit. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and Ernie and <laughs> Elmo and Eddie and Ernie and Snuffleupagus. <laughs> Snuffleupagus. <laughs> no, no, no. But on a serious note, um, it is a pretty crazy situation here with uh, Elmo and Eddie. So um, let's go ahead and dive into it real quick. I want to go ahead and start talking about Elmo Patrick Saunier. I was gonna say Saunier, Saunier, but he's from Louisiana, so I was like. It sounds like a sports drink or something. Or like one of those fancy ass carbonated drinks. <laughs> Sunny D. Yeah, Sonny like, A. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like Perrier. Or yeah, yeah. yeah. It was like, this is some sparkling murder. You know what I'm saying? Pull over at the Valera. I need to get me a Sonny A. <laughs> a grape one, please. If you have <laughs> a grape Sonny A, please. Um, no, for sure. So uh, this is a really interesting dude. And honestly, uh, he's a bit unorthodox in, in the sense that there were only two victims that were actually uh, really discussed here. Now, he, he did say that there were other ones, so he he doesn't quite fit the profile of a serial killer in a sense of convictions, but he kind of was. At least a serial rapist, right? So, Elmo Patrick Saunier, or Pat as he went by, obviously, because no one wants to go by fucking Elmo. <laughs> um, he was born uh, February 21st of 1950 and was eventually electrocuted in the chair. April 5th, 1984. Uh, his own death date was April 4th, but he was killed at like 12, 15 a.m. So mm. the certificate says April 5th. Uh, he's an, an American murderer and rapist, serial rapist, along with his brother. Now, like I said, there was only two victims, but he was still uh, sentenced to death in Louisiana. So Elmo liked to keep it all in the family. Uh, it was just him and his little brother. They were seven years apart, right? Mm-hmm. So at the time of the um, of this of this incident, he was 27 and his little brother was 20. Uh, which I think had a lot to do with the way this kind of this whole thing unfolded. So, um, you know, there are two brothers. Eddie James Saunier is the little brother. And we'll talk a little bit about the crime, and then we'll talk about some other interesting shit that really kind of came to light after the crime, which didn't only have to do with him, but had to do with Sister Helen Prejean, which is a, a very, very interesting person, a Catholic nun. So um, we'll start off with the crime. And then we'll kind of get into the aftermath. So the crime actually took place on November 4th, 1977. This was a while ago, okay? So basically, uh, the way that the way that this went down is um, they were in the Iberia Parish, which is kind of south Louisiana, hmm. uh, a little bit south of New Orleans. The and south we, of the south. Right. And we talked about, um, what's his dick last week, uh, the Bayou Killer. And this was just outside of his jurisdiction, right? So this was uh, years and years before. He was in the 90s, but uh, this took place in the 70s. But the way that this went down is there were two people, 17-year-old David LeBlanc and 18-year-old Loretta Ann. I'm not sure how to say this. Bork? Bork? I don't know. It's, you know, New Orleans. It's kind mm-hmm. of French. Mm-hmm. Bokwa. You know, probably. Not, That's probably right? what it is. I'll just call her Loretta. But their boyfriend and girlfriend. 
And it's interesting because his name is David LeBlanc. I actually used to work with a guy named Ben LeBlanc from Louisiana, and I hit him up about this, and I was like, dude. And he was like, nah, bro, that's not my, <laughs> that's not my family. What about Matt LeBlanc from Friends? Right. So he was his dad. No, Ooh. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wait the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have, I have no idea. I, possibly, right? But How would I not know about this by now? All the LeBlancs are like from Louisiana, right? Oh, uh, those are from Ita- uh, Italy. Italian. Huh? <laughs> they're, they're from Italianos, man. <laughs> But um, the way that the night went down is these these two these two teenagers were high school seniors at a Catholic high school in the Iberia Parish, right? And it was the night of the homecoming football game. You know, super exciting night for the kids. They had a great thing going on, uh, boyfriend and girlfriend. And then after the game, they went into the neighboring parish or neighboring county or however you want to say it. Um, they drove to kind of like a lover's lane type area. And this is in St. Martin Parish right next door, right? That's a popular killing place, like... In the St. Martin Parish? No, uh, Lover's Lane type things, like the Zodiac right. Day. Like. No, for sure. Yeah, it was. And, you know, this was homecoming night. I'm sure these kids were making out, doing their thing in the car. I'm they surprised were... it wasn't more crowded. Yeah. No, seriously. Well, it was the neighboring parish. It was a super secluded area, right? Okay. So they're in the car. They're doing their thing. And around 1 o'clock in the morning, these two guys approach the car. And, of course, it's Elmo and Eddie, 27 and 20 years old, right? Mm. They, Nothing they were hun- they were hunting rabbits. They said <laughs> that's what they said they were doing, right? Really? <laughs> yeah, they said they were hunting rabbits. They had a twenty a twenty two rifle. Um, oh, straight up uh, Elmer Fudd on that shit. Straight up Elmer Fudd. Yo, the last guy was compared to Elmer Fudd, the Bayou Killer was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a Louisiana thing, you know what I mean? And this guy's hunting rabbits, so <laughs> you know it is what it is. But the way that they did this was com- a little twisted. And pretty interesting. What they did is they impersonated police officers, right? So one of the dudes had worked at a security job and he had like a kind of official looking police badge, right? Mm. So they approached the car and they were like super professional. They knocked on the, you know, they knocked on the freaking the window. Hey, what are you kids doing? Right. Mm. And um, the kids freaked out. They were like, oh shit, we've been caught. You know what I mean? They're obviously, (laughs) yeah, they're not doing something they're supposed to be doing. So they pulled them out of the car. They handcuffed them and they had two pairs of handcuffs on them. And, um, they placed him in the back seat and they were like, we're going to go talk to our, we're going to go talk to headquarters real quick. And they kind of disappeared for a minute, which I'm assuming they're just kind of plotting how they were going to handle the situation. And after pulling him out of the car and handcuffing, they put him in their own back seat and they were like, Hey, we're going to go to the land, the owner of the land's house and see if he wants to press charges. Okay. So kind of official so far, but then both of them get into the car the victim's car and start driving it. Now that's my first red flag as a victim. You know what I mean? Like why would, th- where's their police car? You know, <laughs> like they get in the car with them and they're like, we're going to drive to the landowner's house. And they're like, fuck. All right. Whatever. They only brought like a four wheeler. They were just rabbit hunting, right? No. So they, they were, they did have a car and it was, um, you know, kind of like an older car and it was, it was parked out of the way. Right. So a match. So they, I, I, they, and they might've been hunting rabbits. I don't know. What time of year was it? Um, this was in November, right? Okay. Oh, well, it's rabbit season, so. Is I, it? I don't know. Well, it's November, October to February. Oh, in, okay. In Louisiana, so. All right. Well, thanks for that wealth of knowledge. I had no fucking clue. <laughs> so, um, October 6th to February 28th. Really? Mm-hmm. How do you know that? Because your dad? I looked it up. Just right now. Wait, seriously? Yep. Okay, Lightning McQueen. That was fucking ridiculous, but... <laughs> So internet, yeah, no queen kidding. of Google. So they, they say it's rabbit season, right? And that's a, later what they said they were doing. But yeah, they pulled out a security badge and they were like, we're the cops, put it away real quick, handcuffed and put him back in the car. And they were like, we're going to go see if the landowner wants to press charges. However, they keep driving and they wind up at this fucking random oil field. Right. And, and at this point, the kids are like, okay, we're fucked. Right, right. Yeah. We're absolutely fucked. Right. So, mm. And they had a twenty two rifle on them. Like, cops don't use that. You know what I mean? They have a 9 or a forty five or an AR or something. Back then, they didn't have rifles. You know what I mean? Really. They may be a shotgun or something. Well, we've seen a lot of um, a lot of twenty twos don't really do the job right away. You know, they're, they're not... How many... What is that? That's what Dean Coral was shot with? Yeah, twenty two. And mm-hmm. it ricocheted off of his forehead. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Holy shit. And he kept coming. Yeah, I think yeah, that happened But then another. eventually, eventually uh, what's his dick got him, so... Yeah. Right, so they take him out to this random oil field in the middle of nowhere, and they pull him out of the car, and they handcuff uh, LeBlanc to a tree, 
and he knows he's fucked at this point. You know mm. what I mean? He's like, well, obviously, this isn't a police officer. And um, they took the girl, Loretta, from the car and immediately Elmo raped her. So this is something that's kind of comes to light in prison, but they had premeditated this. And although they're not serial killers, they're serial rapists. Mm. And um, later, Elmo would say, you know, I deserve to be caught for the amount of times that I pulled this off successfully. Mm. So they would often take couples from the lover's lane. They would tie up the dude. They would rape the girl, but then they would let him go. And they're like, don't ever fucking say anything. And they were, you know, in a different parish or whatever. So, I mean, they were in, you know, closer to the Baton Rouge area, I think. I, I couldn't find where he was born at, but they, I think they lived closer to the Baton Rouge area. So they kind of disappeared into a few counties away mm. and were able to get away with it until then. But they took the girl out of the car. They raped her or he raped her, Elmo, the older brother. And... Elmo said, hey, look, the way this is going to go down, we're going to release you if you let my little brother have sex with you. That's weird. Yeah. And she was like, fine, totally fine. Just do what you do. Get it over with and let us go. Mm. And apparently that's the way that they had been operating. So afterwards, they took him back to the car. They removed the handcuffs. And then Elmo was like, we can't release them. I'm going to go back to prison. They're going to get, I'm going to get caught. He had been at Louisiana state penitentiary, which by the way, is the same place that Dominique was at. Mm. Right. Um, the Angola prison. He was like, I don't want to go back to prison. I don't know if he just thought like these Dominique's people are there. I don't want to see him. <laughs> no, nah, Dominique was in the nineties, but <laughs> no, he, he said, um, there was something different about this particular killing. And he was like, oh, we're going to get caught this time. We got to kill him. And so, the little brother agreed this and this is this story kind of changes as time goes on but at the at the moment they were the little brother agreed and was like all right we got to kill him so he had them lay down side by side mm. in a ditch um face down never and, a good sign right and the, the fucked up thing is the first shot missed oh good and the girl started crying she knew she was about to die because they fired the rifle and it missed they fired um, three shots into the back of each of their heads, uh, wow. you know, effectively killing them on, on, on the spot. Although I don't know, you know, with a twenty-two, it might have taken a couple shots. You know what I mean? And I, mm-hmm. I start thinking like all this kind of stuff. Like I got really in in depth as far as the thought process, and I thought, you know, the first shot, it didn't kill him. Did it just make her like mentally retarded for a few moments? You know what I mean? Like how scary would that be? You mean just like lost her mind and she didn't right <laughs> no so seriously because you know it would take a few shots to kill him most likely so that, i mean that would be absolutely terrifying now i mean i would hope that the first one would render them unconscious anyway you would hope so yeah right I, i'm not sure but ultimately one of them got shot first so the other one was freaking out you know what i mean mm-hmm. and um the first shot missed so they were both freaking out they knew they were about to die and that's absolutely terrifying um, so they did shoot them, and at that point, the brothers returned that car back to kind of the, the lover's lane spot to try and get away with it. And from there, they walked back to wherever they were parked. Right? They had like an old, uh, an old um, 1961 Dodge Dart. But when they got back to their own car, they were like, "Fuck!" They had a flat tire. Oh, good. Yeah, what a wonderful fucking night, man. You know yeah. what I mean? So they had a flat tire. So they stole a tire jack out of the victim's car to change their own tire, which is partially how they got caught. Mm. So um, Grant. they kept the fucking jack, and the police found it and were like, hey, by the way, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? This doesn't belong to a Dodge Dart, you piece yeah, of shit. exactly. So um, Divine intervention, flat tire. Seriously, who would, who would think, right? So they wound up changing their tire. They, they buried the guns. Um, they took the driver's license of the victims and, and buried that in hopes that they wouldn't know who it was immediately or maybe thinking they would be found much later, something like that. I mean, they have a license plate on the car. I'm pretty sure they would have. Well, they're not perfect, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> You're as we're about to find out. So they were arrested only a month later. You can tell me that Elmo's not a genius? I'm just saying, Elmo and Eddie, you know, not so Sesame Street after all. But they were they were literally arrested a month and a day later. So this was on November fourth. They were arrested December fifth, nineteen seventy seven. So yeah, the first day he confessed to everything. He was like, "We abducted them, or we raped the girl, and then we killed both." Um, a day later, as he was being transported to jail, he confessed it all again. 
to everybody. And then after he was at jail, he confessed it to the prison guards, which they thought was weird that he was like, why is this guy keeping conf- like, bro, you, you're caught. Stop confessing. Like, you know what I mean? Mm. But he was like, it was all me. My brother, my little brother was there, but he didn't do anything, you know, and mm. that I'm, was his motivation. I'm taking the blame for it. You know what I mean? Yeah, so the, the the police actually searched the house, and they found the handcuffs that were used. Uh, they searched his car. They found the car jack, which was kind of the final piece. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And later, they discovered the guns that they had buried, even even so. So uh, th- there was, what, six bullets that were fired, right? Well, there was it seven, because the first one missed. And all of the bullets were mangled beyond recognition, except for one, which they matched back to that twenty two caliber rifle. So for that one bullet, they... Confirmed everything, you know what I mean? Awesome job, police. Yep, for the first time ever. Mm. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? So there was a match made, and they also found a witness that saw Elmo's car in the area. You know, with the flat tire or whatever. I wonder if it was a stupid color too, because I can just imagine like a, a Dodge Dart from the seventies looks like a shit car. Right, like, and it was like green. driven by. Yeah, I was thinking like lime green with like driven by a dude named Elmo. Like what a yeah. fucking asshole. Anyways. <laughs> Both of the brothers were indicted on uh, two counts of first-degree murder. Now, Elmo entered a plea of not guilty by reason of insanity, which I suppose would be the best thing that he could do at the time. Now, It's not a new idea. It's not a new idea, but his lawyer was fucking terrible. Like, Not that I can blame him, but it was like a public appointed attorney. He only met with him for one hour for the entire time. To build his entire defense case. It was two 30-minute sessions. And he had already spent more than that telling everybody he's guilty. So. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. So they were like, all right, well, just say you're insane or whatever. And then as they were being interviewed, the brothers kind of changed up their stories a few times and kind of placed blame on the other guy. And it got kind of weird. They were apparently under the influence of heavy drugs during the time of the killings, which was a bit strange for them. They normally didn't commit their rapes. Or at least they were able to maintain their cool if they were on drugs before. So uh, it wasn't like them to kill people. Hmm. They later admitted to raping several girls, uh, but they would always let them go, right? Like I said before. So that was pretty interesting. In Louisiana law, any person who participates in the killing of another human is subject to the death penalty, right? So it's not necessarily the person that did it, but whoever's involved. Okay. Guilty can, by association? Right. Can get the death penalty, right? And the commission of... Mm-hmm. That. So they had the first trial. This was in, you know, six months later, April of 1978. Um, both of the brothers were sentenced to death because of that reason, right? Mm-hmm. And then immediately they appealed the decision and the court reversed their death sentences due to procedural errors in the trial. Now, at that point, they had new sentencing hearings scheduled for a little bit out. And during his brother's second hearing, Eddie was like, no, nah, that's not how it happened. He recanted his whole testimony. He was like, this is not how it went down. It was a little bit different. He was like, I'm actually the one that killed them. My, my, my big brother's just trying to take the blame for me. You know what I mean? He's like, I'm the one that shot him. And I lost my mind. Uh, generally, we just rape these people and let them go because that's so much better. Mm. But I actually killed him. And the prosecution was like, nah, fool. <laughs> they like, didn't believe him at all. And so they proceeded with um, they proceeded with uh, the, the route they were going, and so they gave the death penalty once again to his brother. But kind of because of the way that this went down and the way that he opened up this new information, they gave his little brother life instead of death. Mm. And so, and it was also because he was so much younger, and there were a few different things that went into it. You know what I mean? But he got life in prison instead of death, and he felt terrible about it. Now Elmo got death again, of course. It was like whatever. Some kind of twisted ass like survivor's guilt. Right, right. And Elma was like, and the judge was like, "Fuck your procedural errors. You're getting death again. You killed these kids, and God knows how many others there were. You know what I mean?" Right. Um, now Eddie got life in prison without parole, and um, eventually, you know, Elma was put to death in 1984. Eddie died in 2013, I think it was, just old age. And, or No, he got sick. It wasn't old age. He got sick in prison, and it was within a couple of weeks he was dead. Hmm. But he had, you know, he had life. So let's talk a little bit about the imprisonment and, and uh, what happened on, on death row, right? So this is something that I didn't know at all at first, but I looked up. I was on, like, YouTube, and I looked up Elmo Sonier. And the first video that appears, it's still the first video, is Sister Helen Prejean. It's like a 35-minute video, and it's translated into German, subtitles for whatever reason. But it's this Catholic nun 
who became a spiritual advisor for inmates on death row. Now, she was from the St. Joseph Parish, in, or I'm sorry, the St. Joseph Congregation in New Orleans, um, although she herself was from Baton Rouge. Now, she spent two years with Pat from 1982 to 1984, like I was saying, and really had a interesting insight into the protocols of death row. What a noble cause. Well, she had some really good points that I, it really interested me. I started this thing just to get a little bit more information on her, this documentary, and I started it, you know, just to get some more information on her. But I wound up, you know, really opening my eyes uh, into this whole thing. And she she brought up some some really good points about uh, opposing the death penalty. So, but she um, worked specifically out of the Louisiana State Penitentiary at Angola and uh, met with a couple death row inmates there. And her whole thing with Pat was that she was she swore that he was a changed man and in my head I'm like okay is is this guy just playing her you know but after 2 years you know she was like he started reading the bible she gifted me his bible uh, he gifted me his bible and was underlining you know certain hymns and verses and what I would say was a, a serious transformation in a person right so does that mean he doesn't deserve to die mm-hmm. eh, it was pretty fucked up what he did you know what i mean um, shouldn't be worried about dying if he's good with his maker. Right. So he, he was <laughs> good with his maker, and he was indeed worried about dying. Um, that never changed, but she really brought a lot of insight into, like I said, like the protocols of death row and the days before it happened. So when she kind of came famous for this, and she wrote a book in 1993 called Dead Man Walking, which was turned into a movie in 1995. She was played by Susan Sarandon, and it really focused on Matthew, I guess, Poncelet, Poncelet, I'm not, you know, I'm kind of doing my Louisiana lingo here, but who was played by Sean Penn, and it was it was pretty famous, so uh, check it out if you get the chance, it's pretty interesting, and it really does focus on Matthew more than it focuses on um, Pat, but interesting um, to say the least. So her whole thing was to, and, and to this day, she's still alive, she's like 80 years old, is to abolish the, the death penalty, and you know, one thing that she brought up was while going through the events of, of what happened during during the actual execution, right? So the first thing that happened is Pat is moved to what they call the death house, which is a specific area of the prison, right? You know, like here in Texas, you go to Huntsville and you go to the separate area, but and it's all in this one prison in Louisiana. So you go to the death house and he's there for like three days before the execution. And Pat got the electric chair. This was not something that they... I think they just do lethal injection now in Louisiana, even though that might be put on hold because of the whole restrictions with the drugs. And we can talk about that in a premium episode about the death penalty. But at the time, it was the electric chair. And she said she showed up. She specifically mentioned the flowers outside of the death house, these red geraniums, and how normal it seemed. And uh, when she walked in there, you know, there's a guy on the outside with with an automatic rifle and a guy on the inside with an automatic rifle. But... She had never really been closer to Pat than these last few days because the guards, she said, were very, very nice. You know, hey, Pat, you need some coffee? You need a cigarette? Like, um, are you okay? Can I get you something to eat? And it was very, like, No wonder normal. he was afraid to die. He was being coddled. <laughs> For real. And it was almost like, she said it was like a hospital, but with the ultimate intention was not saving life. It was ending it. And it was it was very, very eerie. Um, one thing she noticed was when walking in the building, she saw a large electric box on the outside of the building, and she was like, hey, Warden, what is that? And he was like, oh, that's a generator specifically for the electric chair in case the inmates try to cut off the power or rebel or something like that. We'll still be able to electrocute him. Uh, Priorities, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no kidding. So uh, she said it was just very eerie and, and, and very sickening how normal and regimented it was, right? So... Uh, she talked about a few days before the death and how they talked in the cell, and it was a little bit... There was a metal door, but it was a mesh screen in between, so they could kind of put their hands up to each other. They'd never been able to touch before and pray together or anything like that, but she saw him as more of a human in this time than ever before. Um, this is, what, seven, eight years or something like that after the murders, and, and, and she said he was a changed man. He was, you know, practicing scripture and... and yeah, but his... He was a changed man because he had no other option. I thought about that as he well. He was forced to be changed because he was removed from the... Like, that wouldn't have happened if he wasn't on death row, right? Right. I thought about that myself, right? He was removed from freedom to where he could where he could have access to innocent people that he wanted to do with right. rape and murder, you know? Exactly. So, right. um, if she hadn't entered his life and if he hadn't been forced to stop what he was doing, 
he wouldn't have changed. I agree. I completely agree. But she said, have you considered this? She said, I met with several guards who were completely traumatized from the events. There was one guard in particular. Well, there were two guards. One of them pulled her aside right before the execution and said, sister, I don't want to do this. This is my fifth execution. I can't sleep at night. I'm not a good father or husband anymore. I'm a changed man. And it's traumatizing. And she saw several guards that had gone through this like traumatizing process. And she's like, not only should we stop the death penalty because of the convicts, but we should stop it because of what it does to the other good people on the outside. It fucks them up. Like People are quitting. People are getting PTSD. And that one guard was like, I understand that what these people did was terrible. However... When I'm, it's my when it's my job to take another man's life, and they're helpless, it's difficult to do regardless. You well, know people I mean? feel the same way about uh, you know war. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, and they these other the executioners have options. They can stop. <laughs> well, so that one guard that she pulled aside was like, "I have to feed my kids. This is part of my job." I don't know what else I would do. You know what I mean? But I think that gentleman quit after this execution, especially with the electric chair. You know what I mean? That's not a beautiful execution. It's not peaceful. Right. Um, But my point is, like, they have the option to do that. They have the option to walk away. You know, they have, of course. Yeah. Ultimately, there is an option to work there. Right. And people that are in, you know, combat or, Mm -hmm. you know, in an act of war, they they can't just be like, okay, I've had enough of this, so... You know, of course. Right. I mean, but it does fuck people up. I got a friend that, you know, was an infantry Marine and he was a door kicker and he is not the same person. You know what I mean? And I'm not going to say any names. I'm sure everybody's changed, but I get where she's coming from to a certain extent. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, she even talked about her biggest thing was how normal it was. And, and the night before the, um, electrocution they had an electrician come in and check the chair and she was like it's all so procedural and sterile and fucking weird you know what i mean so yeah nothing like a being flung into a ditch and shot three times after being that's what i said molested and raped and tortured you know well, i think we know your opinion on the death penalty yeah. <laughs> but I, I i agree with that it's just I, I understand both sides of it you know i understand why he's dying but i also understand how that could cause trauma for people that work there mm-hmm. and he only died once these guards are doing it often you know what i mean this guy was on his fifth execution already and he was like fuck dude like this shit's just getting to me i'm having nightmares and stuff but but what do you think about the healing that comes to the families who were previously traumatized by their loss of their family members i mean i don't know i've seen closure different... to them does it According to what I've heard. I watched this video the other day and it was a, it was a black gentleman, middle-aged and somebody had killed his daughter and that guy was being put to, I don't know where it was, but I would, you know, I got into like a rabbit hole of executions Mm. and stuff like that. And this dude, as the murderer was sentenced to death or or executed, he was like, well, I guess that's all the closure I'll get. Like it doesn't bring my baby back. You know what I mean? Mm. I want my baby back. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I had to do it, dude. What up? What up? Chili's give us some ribs. Um, anyways, so I, I kind of understand both sides of it, but ultimately, you know, sister Helen Prejean, she, she really, uh, talked about the mental torture that these inmates would go through and, um, the nightmares that they experienced every single night and how they would wake up in the middle of the night <gasps> sweating. And they were like, Oh, I was having this dream that I was being led to the chamber and it was like a recurring thing. And she goes, well, is that violating the amendment regarding cruel and unusual punishment? You know what I'm saying? I think it's, um, I think it's detrimental to the punishment. I think it's probably... Expand on that. What do you mean? It's more of a punishment probably than the actual act of putting them to death. Especially... I agree. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think... There was a quote that uh, Sister Helen talked about, and she said it was... I forgot who who said the quote in the first place, but it was like, uh, these people will die a thousand deaths before they actually die. Practice makes perfect, motherfucker. You know what I mean? I mean, fuck them. Like, in my opinion, you mm-hmm. shouldn't have been. But then at the same time, I'm like, are these people sick? Is it a mental incapacity that we're not aware of? Should they be put in a mental hospital for the, you know? 
but then it's a taxpayer burden, and it's like, oh, God, I don't know. Oh, there's so many things to think about. Believe me, I, I know. It's tough. And, and we talked about it a little bit, I think, last week, and I was like, I don't know if I could do it. You know what I mean? There's people that have that have been sentenced to death for killing one person, and there's people that have killed 75 people, and they, they got life in prison. So, yeah. you know, there's – it's it's all relevant. It's all di- – right. or, you know, relative, I guess, is the word I was looking for. It's it all – made sense to me. <laughs> It's all, there's no rhyme or reason. It's, it's weird, but I guess deep down, i I kind of feel like uh, life is not, what's the word I'm looking for? Gay. It's, a, it's not. I'm just kidding. I don't know. Like, <laughs> you know, having a life, some people don't deserve it. It's yeah. a, it's, it's a privilege, not a right. You know what I mean? And is these, it? Yeah. When they take somebody else's without their consent. Sure. Yeah, and that's you know that's a, that's a good point because Sister Helen was like it was so hard to watch him die without his consent, and I'm like, well, guess what, bitch? <laughs> you know what I'm like, I wonder, guess who else died without their consent? Yeah, I wonder. These two innocent teenagers, you know what I mean? If she had to, and God knows who before that, right? If what she are, had to go up there and sign in and then watch a short video of the two teenagers that he killed. Doing doing the actual crime yeah. every single time she walked in there, if they showed her that video, how different would her opinion be? I don't know because then it's like God and forgiveness, and it's you know should they just be separated from society? And it's this they whole are. thing. I'm good with it. <laughs> yeah, separate them further than anything. Like right, and it, and you know what? Like he was dead within like I think 25 seconds. So, because it was the electric chair. So, but w- w- what was really interesting is she talked about the last few moments and, you know, the electrician came and checked the chair and all this, sh- you know, I imagine his anxiety is through the fucking roof at this point. So the guards come and they say, Elmo, it's time. And they take him away. They shave his head. They shave his eyebrows and they shave a little portion of his right leg so that they can attach a lead because he has to be grounded for the electricity to work. Right. Mm-hmm. And the way that she described it was like he was like a baby bird afterwards. Like he was helpless. You know what I mean? And he had he had a lot of strength. This whole thing was like, I'm not going to break in front of these people. Um, I want to maintain my some form of dignity, you know? And as he rounded the corner and entered the room with the chair, he collapsed. His legs didn't work anymore. And he was like, he looked up at Sister Helen and he was like, I'm about to die. And she was like, Yep. <laughs> like, she, like, what are you going to say to that? You know what I mean? And she said, I'll be the face of Christ for you. You keep looking at me. And I understand where she's coming from as a, as a child of God, as a sister. You know what I mean? I completely understand where she's coming from. Mm-hmm. But I completely understand where the state's coming from. And I completely understand where the prisoner's coming from. Mm-hmm. The families are coming from. It, it's, it's hard to, you know, it, it, I feel like only God can judge me is like really one of those. It, it's a tough thing to consider. And honestly, guys... I want to hear your feedback. Uh, you know, we got at least 4,000 listeners or whatever. I want you guys to talk to us about what you think because, um, shit, man, this is, a, this is a tough, tough subject for everyone. Everyone has their own opinion, and I would love, love, love. Maybe we'll put something on Facebook, uh, some type of poll or, or, or whatever to see where you guys. I know everybody picked the gas chamber a few weeks ago. Y'all are crazy as hell. but um, <laughs> When it comes down to it for me, I think. These people that are committing these crimes, they know in the back of their head Mm -hmm. they're liable to get caught. That's why they go to the extents they do to try to cover their tracks. They know that Louisiana is a death penalty state. They know the risks to their own life when they Mm -hmm. do these things. And it still doesn't deter them from doing these things. So you got what you asked for. So fuck them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. I understand. And I'm not going to say that I would be comfortable executing somebody or that I'd be comfortable even watching an execution. Right. Um, I think I could find it in myself to do it if somebody I loved was killed, you know. Yeah. Um, but it's not because I, you know, it's not for any other reason except for they don't have any kind of they're not they're not you know um, compatible with society. Yeah, they're yeah. not um, contributing anything to society. <laughs> Say fool, this shit is not going to work out. You know what yeah. I mean? No, I completely understand. My thing is, I completely understand all aspects of everybody's argument. You know. Mm-hmm. So I can that's see the tough. But, on all of them too. Um, um, you know, she did say as far as his execution, he was executed at uh, you know roughly his. It was set for twelve a.m. on April fifth, so just April fifth. 
Um, and by 12.15, the whole thing was over. And, and, and she said that it was the weirdest expression of time she's ever seen. It stood still, and it raced faster than she's ever seen at the exact same time. And it was just very eerie and very weird. Um, Does she sit through every execution of everybody she's... No. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of those people. But the really crazy thing about this was... You know, a couple episodes ago, we talked about the uh, death penalty on a national level being stopped, right? Mm-hmm. Well, it was like 1972, which is why what's his face got out of uh, prison like a hundred times or whatever. Timoth- Kenneth. Ken- Kenneth. I almost said Timothy McVeigh. <laughs> uh, Kenneth McDuff. There's a Mick something. Yeah. In there. Like fucking Donalds, anyways. Um, <laughs> so it was started again in 1983, at least in Louisiana. This was in 1984. He was only the third guy to be executed, so she was actually allowed into the chamber with him. Um, which is no longer allowed, but she was allowed to touch him with the warden's permission and pray on him and, and things like that. Now, the way that the last few seconds of this guy's life went was they said, what are your last words? And he wasn't sure what his last words were going to be. Who, for uh, what, Elmo? Elmo? Yeah. Wouldn't they for, be like prayers? <laughs> I mean, it- So he was pissed off because he knew his little brother did it. He said, my little brother was the one that shot him. Sour grapes. His little brother was in prison bragging that he was the one that did it, which has pissed him off, I'm sure. He had a lot of feelings. His lawyer only spent one hour with him for his defense. He was pissed off at the fucking world. You know what I mean? Still and, guilty. Oh, he's still guilty as fuck. And Sister Helen said, you can choose your last words. Are they going to be words of love or are they going to be words of hate? And so his last words were asking forgiveness from God and from the boy's parents which was kind of weird because he didn't ask forgiveness from the girl's parents who were sitting in the same room and they thought that was kind of weird um but he asked forgiveness and um as they put the mask over his head right before they put the mask over his head for the electrocution he looked at sister helen through the window and said i love you and she reached out and said i love you too and that was his last words uh they put the mask over his face and then she closed her eyes sister helen and heard the switch flip and when she opened her eyes, he was he was gripping the chair with one hand, and the other hand was his fingers were curled up backwards because of the electricity. Um, watched him watch the doctor take the mask off, shine the light into his eyes. There was absolutely no response, and his heartbeat had stopped. At that point, you know they knew she was, that he was dead. Um, as she left the prison, surrounded by other nuns, because she was like fuck, like she was fucked up from it. You know what I mean? Mm. She vomited on the way home and and cried for weeks and just. I understand where she's coming from, you know what I mean? Especially as a nun, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, but it was tough. He gifted the Bi- his Bible to her and he wrote, in the Catholic Bible, you know, there's like um, births and deaths and... Um, Resurrections. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> year 33. Done it first. <laughs> right? He wrote his own death in the death section. He was like, Elmo, Pat Sonnier, Elmo P. Sonnier, um april 1984 or whatever no resurrection no resurrection yeah so he's still dead um he was buried in a they actually took his body and he was buried in a catholic cemetery reserved for nuns believe it or not i wonder who had a hand in that i know right so doubt it was jesus (laughs) i don't know i can't speak on that level uh that's above my pay grade that's for sure (laughs) Uh, but it was really you know and she and she talked about being very cold and very weak and you know, I, I watched a couple documentaries after this, and you know, it was one of the I forgot the prison, but it was a warden, and he was walking onto death row, and they were like, "Are these people nice? You know what I mean? Like, are they nice now?" Like, the reporter was asking, and the warden was like, "Honestly, I obviously cannot call these people my friends, but there are some qualities of these people that would make you feel bad about killing them. Seriously." Well, everybody has a touch of humanity, some right. more than others. And he's like, it's, you know, I've spent 10 years with these fucking people. It's like, it's hard sometimes, you know what I mean? And even that's coming from the warden. Mm-hmm. And he's like, and I'll, <laughs> and I'm the one that tells him to pull the fucking switch. You know what I mean? I really would like to do an, uh, like an extra episode on the death penalty and we can talk. And I know people have talked about it before, but we're really fucking good at talking about it. <laughs> so we can talk about what gas is like, what electric's like, what lethal's like. You know what I mean? We can go through hanging. We can, I would love, firing squad. I would love to talk about that because it's such a fucking interesting subject. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Imagine knowing the moment that you're going to die. That's fucking crazy. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. you know, some of these big burly people like Elmo himself, Pat, whatever, he went by Pat. I don't give a fuck. Um, I picture him collapsed. small. No, he's huge. Really? Yeah, he was like 6'5". Oh, really? I pictured somebody that was like 
little, little. No, I guess no, the name no. Elmo threw me off. Right. I thought he had red hair. No, and definitely not. He was a big dude. And even Sister Helen was like, I didn't expect that because we had always sat. It was almost like confession. He was in a cell, like crunched up. And I was on the other side of a metal door. During the execution, he stood up and she was like, oh, fuck. And she had to like put his hand up on his shoulder to pray with him. And, but somebody that manly and, and, and disgusting walked in, walked around the corner with the warden, looked at the chair and straight collapsed. His knees buckled. And he was like, I'm about to die. And they were like, yup. <laughs> it just boggles my mind that he had no problem taking somebody else's life. And he's that terrified of death himself. It, you know, there's. But that makes me wonder, is this, was it a mental illness? Like, what you know and so many people bring race into it and they're like oh if he was black he was fucking you know a criminal if he was white he was mentally ill dude i think all these people are mentally ill to some extent like i cannot imagine taking another person's life unless it was a marine in the battlefield and that still fucks us you know what i mean like that still mentally fucks with a lot of us you know what i mean i've never done it um, but the people that do will never talk about it i would never ask them about it yeah i've never asked you i have no idea i know that you worked on Aircraft. Yeah, I worked on aircraft, so I was what they call a pogue. Mark Wilson, you know what's going on. <laughs> um, so, oh, he's going to lose his mind this time. Oh, again. shit, what's <laughs> up, Mark? You know what I mean? Um, no, it means for it means person other than grunt. And it's, you know, there's kind of this military thing that, like, you're not a real badass unless you've been in this shit, right? So, I mean, I've deployed several times, but I'm always on an air base. I'm away from it. Um, there's no nothing, you know what I mean? So... Um, infantry people can come back with some serious issues, you know, truthfully. Well, that's a big problem in this country. So. And we're killing bad guys for real, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, like, I mean, it, I don't know. There's so much that goes into it. But ultimately, that's the story of uh, Pat and his little brother, Eddie. It has and, opened and up Sister a whole Helen. lot of discussion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And Sister Helen Prejean. So, um, Really, you can, and by the way, you can check her out at sisterhelen.org. She has a bunch of stuff that's uh, coming out. And I was just about to say that, but she's got her own. Yeah, of course. Well, she's founded like three different things, and, and she's, you know, an advocate. So, uh, really interesting. Whatever, whatever side of the fence you're on, it's very interesting to say the least. So, we'd love to hear from you guys and, and see kind of what your thoughts on it are. I feel like this conversation isn't even over. I mean, we could do a whole other episode on just the death penalty, and hopefully, we get the chance to. Yeah, and I mean, if, you know, if you don't agree with the death penalty, it's it's a personal decision i guess mm-hmm. um i personally you know think some people don't deserve it to, to live so yeah um but, but what's the best way to kill him i mean i don't know should we shoot him in the head some prisoners want to just be shot in the head some people are like we should do to them what they did to other I was people gonna say if you feel noticed none of them wanted that, that to be done you know what i mean oh, you've never had anybody say i want you to beat me to death with a freaking tree tree branch or you know yeah uh mm-hmm molest me or mutilate with a wine or, bottle or something yeah or, yeah or put me on the railroad tracks or, or fucking chunk of concrete or mm-hmm. you know what i mean that none of them want to go through that bathtub full of acid right yeah, yeah probably so. not the best way to go so it would probably not be as quick huh yeah you know it is what it is just soak a little while and Have you seen, uh, we'll check on you in what is it breaking breaking bad where they put the dude in the bathtub and it falls through the roof and he's like oh fuck yeah <laughs> i told you a plastic tub yeah exactly. chemicals are weird oh man i guess you've seen it but anyways, I mean, that's really what we got. Sean Vincent Gillis. Gillis or Gills? Gillis. Sean Vincent Gillis, uh, Elmo Patrick Sonnier, and Eddie James Sonnier. So that's kind of the story of that. Um, if you Please, like I said, hit us up on Facebook. We'll throw some you know polls out there or whatever like that. Look um, at you, Mr. Sexy Voice. Mr. Sexy Voice over here. Yeah, we've gotten reports that uh, Chris is the sexy voice. I <laughs> Mine has been so bad. You're like dying. Yeah. The- <laughs> Stupid allergies. Well, I have experience with microphones and I'm an audio engineer and um, I probably shouldn't have said that because you're going to expect more, but that's okay. We have a limited budget currently. Hit us up on Patreon and uh, not yet, but we're almost there. We are on YouTube now. Um, probably have been on there by the time this is released for a week or so. So uh, we don't have any subscribers yet. We just actually it was, we went on YouTube today. So, um, hit us up on there, man, and, and we'll be back next week for episode number nine. We're going to talk about some cool stuff, as well as um, please keep an eye out for our premium content. Like I said, Jill was a paranormal investigator. I have some really cool stories, and honestly, Jill's expertise with paranormal investigating is more so than serial killers because she did it professionally. So yes. um, if you guys are interested in anything like that, please check us out. I promise it's going to be worth your time. We love you guys so much. You're our favorite weirdos. And we'll see you next week, huh? Thanks, guys. Mwah. Be easy. <laughs>